Let's pause for a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Father, thank you so much for this day. You've blessed us today with warmth and with sunshine. We're grateful. We know that we have additional rain coming ahead of us, Father, but then this state has been suffering from parched conditions for a long time. So thank you for blessing us and filling up the reservoirs and our mountains with snow. We're grateful, Father, for that. And we're grateful for each and every one who is here. And we pray, Father, that as we open your word and study from your word, that it will have an impact on our life. Not just for the moment as we hear it and then we leave this building and forget, but fill us with your Holy Spirit to then make application of the word to our lives so that it has an effect on us, not just today, but going forward this week and this month and this year. Answer Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So as you can see from the title, I wanted to let you know that each of you has something in common with Jesus. And the reason why I thought I would deliver this message to you is that sometimes in our Christian walk, we view Jesus as somebody that's unapproachable. And it is a bit of a dichotomy because clearly he was sinless and we are not. So in that sense, he's completely unapproachable. And yet he came to this earth, dwelt among us, as we talked about last Sunday, so that he could be one of us. And I wanted to at least give you maybe a little vignette about certain characteristics that we might be able to identify more easily with the Savior whom we came to worship today. And so the text of the message is taken from the book of 2 Samuel, an Old Testament book, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws that are written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise that he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. So this particular Bible character story started in a sheep pasture where woolly heads witnessed his early days and these quiet bucolic fields welcomed, at the time, his very young eyes. Before people listened to his message, sheep would actually turn to his call. And you queue up all the creatures that have heard the, his voice and probably the grass grazers will claim a place near the front of that line. His story began in a Bethlehem pasture. The small hamlet of Bethlehem was perched on very gentle slopes. It was the home of shepherds, but it was also the land of figs and olives and vines. Nothing really too lush, but it was sufficient wasn't known to the world, but it was known to God, who, for his own reasons, chose Bethlehem as the incubator to his chosen child. Chosen, indeed, he was chosen by God, anointed on high and set apart by heaven. The prophet declared his call, the family heard it, the lad of the sheep would become the shepherd of souls. Bethlehem's boy would be Israel's king, but not before he became the target of hell. The road out of Bethlehem was steep and dangerous. It led him through a desert. It led him to an angry Jerusalem and was full of conflict and all sorts of peril. 
Leaders had resolved to kill him. His people had sought to stone him. His own family chose to mock him. Some people lifted him up as the king, while others cast him down. Jerusalem's gate saw him enter as a sovereign and then leave its gates as a fugitive. He eventually died a lonely death in the Hebrew capital. But he is far from dead. His words still speak. His legacy still lives. Love or hate him, society still keeps turning to him, reading his thoughts, pondering his deeds, maybe even imagining his face. Scripture gives only very scant information about his looks, so we've had sculptors and artists filling galleries with their private speculations as to how he appeared. Artists like Michelangelo, Rembrandt, Da Vinci. And then they used canvas, and they used stone, and they used paintings and sculptures and books. Oh, books. Thousands and thousands of pages have been devoted to Bethlehem's prodigy. We can't stop talking about him. Sand has filled his Judean footsteps thousands of times over thousands of years, but still we gather to reflect on his life. And you probably know who I am describing. Well, at least I think you do, or maybe you should. You know, the pasture, the anointing, the childhood call, the lifelong enemies, the wilderness, Jerusalem, Judea, and then that lonely death of his, the endless legacy. Who is this boy from Bethlehem? Well, as we started the lesson, it's David, right? Or is it Jesus? Or maybe it's both. Because if you list a dozen facts, each describe the twin traits of David and Jesus, which I think is pretty amazing. Even more so is the fact that you can do the same with your life as well. For instance, listen to these truths and tell me who I am describing. Am I describing Jesus or am I describing you? Born to a mother, familiar with physical pain, enjoys a good party, rejected by friends, unfairly accused, loves stories, reluctantly pays taxes, Sings, turned off by greedy religion, feels sorry for the lonely, unappreciated by siblings, stands up for the underdog, kept awake at night by concerns, known to doze off every once in a while in the middle of trips, accused of being way too rowdy, and afraid of death. Who does that describe? You? Jesus? Maybe both of you? It seems to me that you and I, kind of like David, have a lot in common with Jesus. And is that a big deal? Well, yeah, I kind of think so. I think it's a big deal because that means that Jesus understands you. He understands me. He understands small town anonymity. And he also understands big city pressures. He's walked pastures of sheep and palaces of kings. He's faced hunger, sorrow, 
and death and wants to face them with you. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 said this, that Jesus understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. You see, church, he became one of us. And he did so so that he could redeem all of us. The stories of David and Jesus share many names. If you read their stories, you'll hear the names of Bethlehem and Judea and Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives and the Dead Sea and En Gedi. You hear all those things for those two individuals. And while their stories are similar, we don't want to think for a moment that they're identical. Because clearly, Jesus had no Bathsheba collapse or Uriah murder or adultery cover-up. Jesus never pillaged a village, never camped with the enemy, and never, ever neglected a child. No one accused the fairest son of Bethlehem of polygamy, brutality, or adultery. In fact, no one successfully accused Jesus of anything at all. They tried. But when accusers called him the son of Satan... Jesus asked for their proof. In John chapter 8, verse 46, Jesus said, Can any one of you convict me of a single misleading word, a sinful act? And no one could. I mean, the disciples traveled with him, right? Enemies scrutinized him. Admirers studied him, but no one could convict him of sin. No one spotted him in the wrong place, ever heard him say the wrong thing, or ever saw him respond the wrong way. Peter, who was three years Jesus' companion, said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, he never did one thing wrong. Not once said anything amiss. Pilate was the head of the Roman version of the CIA. Yet when he tried to find fault with Jesus, he couldn't. And you can find that in John chapter 18, verse 38. Even the demons called Jesus, quote, the Holy One of God, and that can be found in Luke chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus never, ever, ever missed the mark. Equally amazing, he never, ever, ever distances him from those like us who do. For instance, just read the first verse of Matthew's gospel. Jesus knew David's ways. He had witnessed the adultery. He had winced at the murders. He had grieved at David's dishonesty. But David's failures didn't change Jesus' relation to David. The initial verse of the first chapter of the first gospel in the New Testament calls Jesus Christ in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, the son of David. 
The title doesn't have any disclaimers, has no explanations, and no asterisks. I mean, if it had been me, being the lawyer that I am, I would have probably added a footnote. Something along the lines like, this connection in no way offers tacit approval to David's behavior. Right? But no such words appear. David blew it. Jesus knew it. But he claimed David anyway. He did, <laughs> he did for David what my friend's father did for me and my friend Kevin. Kevin and I grew up together in the city of Bellflower, and Kevin lived across the street from me. And back in our elementary school days, Kevin got a BB gun for Christmas. Now, <clears throat> being the boys that we were, we immediately set up a firing range in his backyard. And we spent the entire afternoon shooting at what we had was an archery target. You know, kind of big and round in the bullseye. But after a while, we got bored because it was easy to hit that big target. So Kevin came up with this genius idea sent me into his house and told me to get a handheld mirror. And with that, Kevin placed the gun on his shoulder facing backward, spotted the archery's bullseye in the mirror, and did his absolute best Buffalo Bill impersonation. Unfortunately, Kevin missed the target. He also missed the garage behind the target, and he also missed the fence behind the garage. We had no idea where his shot went, but our neighbor across the street did, because he soon appeared asking who had shot the gun and who was going to pay for his broken living room window? Okay? Then you need Jesus, just like we all do. So at this point in time, being the brave soul that I was and Kevin's best friend, I disavowed knowing him as my friend. I claimed to be a holiday visitor from Canada. Kevin's father, however, was a lot more noble than me. Hearing the noise, he appeared in the backyard and talked with the neighbor. And among his words that I remember hearing him say were these, yes, they are my children, and yes, I'll pay for their mistake. And I wasn't even his child, technically speaking, because you know, I was Canadian. <laughs> and you know, church, Jesus Christ says the same thing about you. Because he knows you miss the target. He knows you can't pay for your mistakes. But he can. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins. And since Jesus Christ was sinless, he could. Since he loves you, he did. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, this is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 
He became one of us so that he could redeem all of us. The Hebrew writer, again, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, says, Jesus, who makes people holy, and those who are made holy are from the same family. So he is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. He wasn't ashamed of David, and he isn't ashamed of you, and he isn't ashamed of me. He calls you brother. He calls you sister. The question is, do you call him savior? And I want you to take a moment to think about the answer to that question. Do you call him Savior? Now, for most that are here this morning, except for those who are listening online, most of you here are Christians. You've called him Savior. But maybe there are others who haven't. Or... Even if you've called him Savior, perhaps you've never really come to a point where you can grasp how much he loves you. Now you do. Jesus didn't disown David, and he won't disown you. He simply awaits your invitation. One word from you and God will do again what he did with David and with millions that are like David. He'll claim you. He'll save you. And then he will use you. Like David, your greatest Goliaths will fall. Your failures will be flushed and death will be defanged. The power that made gnats out of David's giants, will do the same with yours. And you can face those giants this week because you faced God first. I don't know how anyone can successfully navigate life without facing God first. But as you know, many try. For the most part, my experience is that those who try to do it without God aren't terribly successful. And I'm not talking about success in the terms of monetary success or fame. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about being able to put your head on the pillow at night and being able to sleep, having a hope for tomorrow, not feeling crushed by circumstances. I think, church, if you will read God's word and pray, you begin to develop a more intimate relationship with Jesus and you find out that our Savior is a lot more like us than he is not like us. Aside from him being perfect and obviously God's son, he came here and experienced the same things we did and he still loves us. That's pretty amazing. There are probably very few people in your life who can look you in the eye and say, you know what, I love you unconditionally. Because there always seems to be strings attached, right? But not with Jesus. He looks you in the eye, he pierces your heart, and he says, you know what, Randy, I love you unconditionally. All I want you to do is love me back and trust me. So, this week, as I try and give you your assignments for the week, I want you to fall more deeply in love with your Savior. Because I know most of you have called him your Savior. But you can't really put trust in somebody that you don't really know. So the more you read about him, the more you study, the more you pray, the deeper that relationship goes and the deeper the trust will be. 
So this week, follow your Lord. Follow your Savior. Know him. Because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. Jesus is the best reflection of God that we will ever have. And so if we fall in love with the Savior, we will see the Father who sent him and one day hope to be with him once again. So if you have any prayer requests, in just a moment, Steve's going to lead us in the next song. Thank you, Christine. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And that's the song that Steve is going to lead us in. And as we sing that song, if you have any prayer requests, you can hand them up. We will then talk about those, pray about those, and then we'll be dismissed. So if you would, let's stand and let's sing, please. So I didn't have any prayer requests that were brought up, but I will remind you to consult the back of the bulletin and just a few updates on that. I had mentioned last week that Karen had come down with pneumonia and that she had blamed her husband for giving it to her. And Neil strongly disavowed any connection whatsoever with transmitting pneumonia, all to find out that Karen is now feeling much better and now she's visiting family back in, is it Tennessee, Neil? Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma, where the wind comes rolling down the lake. You just never know what you're going to get when you come to church on Sunday. So anyways, Karen is now in Oklahoma with her family, obviously feeling better. Justin is really good about following up with church members, and so we found out that Glenn and Billy have not been with us. For a couple weeks, they were at their tractor convention. That's what they like to do. But then Billy has had some sort of a respiratory illness, and so as a result, they thought it best for her, especially with the inclement weather that we had the past couple of Sundays, for her just to stay indoors would be better. So they're doing fine. It's just she's trying to get better and trying to get healthy. Larry Walton, as I mentioned to you before, has been transferred to a boarding care facility here in Escondido. And speaking with Chrissy, he's getting to a point where we hope that we'll be able to call him and go visit with him. And hopefully he can once again join us here at church as well. And then, Brenda, we know that you had a friend um, who lost her life. Um, uh, a service was here uh, yesterday, and so uh, we grieve with your family and with your friend who had that loss in their life. It's difficult. Same thing with Samuel losing his mom, Josie. Uh, and then we've got <laughs> Missy who lost her husband, John. I mean, you know, it's interesting David was telling his son Solomon, look, I'm going to a place where everyone is going to go. And we all know that, right? I mean, it's not a surprise. And yet, it's difficult to lose people that we love. And so let's keep all those people in our prayers. So with the time change and spring in front of us, I think it's the 21st of this month, I think, 21st or 22nd, Dale was talking about doing a little spring cleaning at home. In other words, giving away items that haven't been used. For instance, I've tried to take a page out of your book. So in my closet, I have all of my shirts. You're going to think this is weird, but there is a reason for it. I have all my shirts hanging in one direction. When I use it, I then hang it in a different direction. So that in six months, I can look at my closet, and if... I have shirts that were hanging in the original position in which they were hung, and I haven't used them in six months. I'm probably not going to use them. So it's a real easy way for me to then take those things out and donate them. So Dale was talking about maybe putting together odds and ends golf carts. <laughs> okay, that's a bit much. Golf clubs, possibility. Golf shoes, definitely. Old golf balls, yes. All those things. If there are items that are accumulating in your house, and it's something that you would like to be able to give some charitable life to, then perhaps we'll be working with Dale and coming up with maybe a time in which we can have kind of a church yard sale, and those things can be sold, and the church can receive, obviously, some assistance that way, and maybe they'll go to good homes where they can be used. Well, Curtis and I, you know, we get together from time to time, and we talk about how we can trick church members, and this was our latest one. 
How can we get them really frustrated with the Lord's Supper? I know. We'll get something that's so challenging you can't open it. And then when you apply too much pressure, you're afraid that the grape juice is going to spill all over the pew and onto your lap. So thank you. We, I think we've maybe landed on something that seems to be comfortable to all. If you have a different opinion, please let us know, and we'll share that. And then Dee Dee's other comment was about uh, Maurice and about Jose. They have really been a blessing. And Curtis and I are trying to integrate more people into our worship service so that you can see different people's hearts, especially younger people's hearts. I mean, you see me all the time, but to see Maurice talk about the things that he did and the thankfulness that we should have, to hear Jose on the fly incorporating what Maurice said into what Jose had already prepared to say, that was outstanding. And so we have some really gifted people here. And so what we're trying to do is plug them into areas where they can succeed and really bless this church. So thank you. I appreciate that. Anything else? If not, let's pause for a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. God, we're thankful for the day that you provided to us, and we're thankful for each and every one who is here this morning. I mean, you've heard us. You've heard us talk like a family. You've heard us talking about the Lord's Supper, and you've heard us talking about rummage sales, and you've heard us talking about missing family members, and you've heard us talk about those who are hurting. God, that's what families do, and we're so blessed to have this Oak Hill family. We pray, Father, that you would send more people here so we can be a family to them as well. We love hurting hearts because we know that you can provide them hope and help. And so, Father, as we go about our week this week, help us to be mindful of those who could use our prayers. Samuel, as he's grieving the loss of his mom, Josie, and for... Richard King, who always has a prayer on his heart for so many people that he serves, for the thanksgiving and praises that we can always be mindful of and offering, including Gabe's recent experience with getting custody back of his daughter and being able to be provided with some transportation. We're mindful of Larry Walton as he continues to rehabilitate. We're mindful of former members like Carl Van, who used to be here. Father, this is a family that really enjoys worshiping with one another, serving one another, and more importantly, being here to encourage one another. So, Father, as we go about our week, guide us and direct us. Help hurting hearts like Brenda's friend who was here yesterday memorializing a loved one who's lost. Give them hope and give them help. And then help us, Father, be a church that's prepared to minister to those with whom we can then be involved by providing them with hope and with help. So watch over us this week. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to walk out of here, Father, feeling encouraged, knowing that there are many things in which we have in common with your Son, Jesus Christ. He refers to us as his brothers and his sisters. That's a familial connection that's very different than sometimes the way we look at your Son and it's difficult as humans, Father, you, you made us so you know, but on the one hand, we see him as our Savior, and on the other hand, we see him as our friend. Help us to be able to expand our mind to know that he is both. And then to share that news with others, because we live in a world, Father, that is looking for answers, and they're looking for these answers in every possible area except for the Bible. Help us to point them back to the truth because heaven knows we could use the truth. So God, again, watch over us, bless us, guide us, heal us, and bring us back next Sunday. And through Christ we pray, amen. God bless all of you. Have a great day and a great week.